Okay. Okay, I'm just going to stand here, I guess. So, um, hemp, probably most of you know that. Cannabis sativa, it's an herbaceous flowering plant. It comes from Eastern Asia originally. Um, it happens to be in the same family as hops and half berries, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, many of the cultivar cultivars are dioecious, which means they have male and female plants, which adds kind of another interesting twist to the production side of it. Uh, it has not been legal to grow in the U.S. since about 1970, but uh, there is some evidence that the last commercial crop of hemp was actually planted in 1957, so um, previous to, the, to some of our more, more recent research. So it's, it's been around a while, but it's been a lot of years we haven't been growing it. Instead, we've been importing it from mostly Canada and China. So there's an interesting um, article here, the plant of, of the thousand and one molecules. There's a lot of fascinating um, compounds in the, in, in the hemp plant, but there are m many cultivars, right? So we have cultivars that are grown for fiber, some that are grown for seed, and as there's hemp seed here in the back, um, mostly as a food and oil seed. And then cannabidiol, the CBD, which is one thing we're very more familiar with in terms of the health benefits, potential health benefits. Um, pain and epilepsy are two of the big um, things that people are using CBD for managing. And then, of course, we have the recreational side of it, which is the THC, or which is classified as marijuana. So the fiber cultivars typically are about 25 to 33 percent fiber, and they are used for uh, fabric, rope, carpet, insulation, construction, bioplastics, animal bedding. I mean, you name it. There are, there are a lot of uses for the fiber. Uh, it's grown as a field crop. I think this picture is interesting here looking at the difference in the stem between a fiber and a narcotic plant. Uh, the fiber cultivar is being typically more hollow, which allows more energy to go into the fiber production and less into the um, production of, of uh, THC. So that's kind of an interesting thing, I think, there. Again, we're importing a lot of fiber. We're importing um, fabrics and then you know, clothing, fabrics, different things like that, as well as it can go into some of the bioplastics and industrial uses as well. This is an example of the different types of fibers. You have the long fibers that are high in lignin, used for concrete materials, absorbent, bedding, um, cleanup. They have some antibacterial properties that are kind of interesting. And then you have your short bast fibers down here, which are higher in cellulose, biocomposites, and bioplastics and fabrics. So there's just a lot of interesting things in the plant there. Our oilseed uh, crop, so it's used as a, as a food, um, high quality oilseed for food, health supplements, personal care. It can be used for lubricants, paint, solvents. It's very high in protein and essential fatty acids, and it's supposed to be a very, it's a very uh, healthy seed crop, right, oil seed. Uh, does not contain any appreciable amounts of THC or CBD. That's important. And it's grown typically as a field crop, so you can see the seed as they make for harvest in the bottom. We also have the CBD cultivars that are high in levels, that are high in CBD and low in THC. Uh, like I said, epilepsy and pain are the two sort of big categories for the health benefits, all sorts of personal care products. It's grown as a specialty crop, uh, and typically female clones, and it looks a lot more like marijuana than your fiber and oil seed crops. In fact, I was reading something a while back that we shouldn't even be putting this in with the industrial hemp. It should go, it's very much, it's much more similar to marijuana than it is to the hemp, the field crops of hemp. This is a picture of a female flower of the hemp CBD cultivar growing in a greenhouse. And as we notice these little sticky trichomes here. Um, that's from that article that you know, planted the 1,001 molecules. And that's where your, um, your oils there are that are of value to be the oils. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Where that's, where, that's really what you're harvesting there. And there's where it is on the plant. This is um, some information that came from the um, Hemp Industry Daily and put together on the top 10 uh, <coughs> hemp producing states in 2017 and what their average wholesale price was for the fiber, the seed, and the flour. What's interesting here, this is not exactly an open market. These are states that have research, sort of state managed research programs over the last few years. These prices, of course, are, are, are not an open market, but I think what's interesting to look at Colorado had 386 licensed growers. Fiber was selling at about 10 cents a pound, seed was selling at about $9 a pound and flour was selling at about $28 a pound. And if you look at that, that trend continues across all of those states. The fiber is not worth very much per pound. Um, seeds are worth a little bit more, and the flour itself is worth a lot more. So that kind of just illustrates the value of the different parts of the plant. And again, remember, these are different cultivars. Someone logged in my account. <laughs> this is an interesting report that comes from the Congressional Research um, Service. And again, this is data, um, hemp industry data, and this is all imported product, right? So looking at where the, the product that we're importing and, and retail sales in 2016 estimated at about 688 million, and about a quarter of that is personal care products, 
Uh, about 20%, almost 20% goes to industrial applications. Uh, about 20% goes into the CBD uh, category, some textiles. So this kind of gives you a general idea of where the imported hemp in this country has been going recently. Again, this is a little bit uh, centric to Wyoming and the Bighorn Basin here, but wanted to look at what uh, we're looking at in terms of uh, water use and fer fertility use compared to typical crops we grow under irrigated agriculture in the Bighorn Basin. That's north, north, uh, north of here. So yes, hemp can grow under low fertility conditions and under drought conditions, but from what I understand, if you want really high yielding crops, particularly for, on the fiber and seed side of things, you have to grow it like a high input corn, like a high yielding corn crop. So it's a high input crop if you want high yields, right? Um, so looking at just how it kind of compares to maybe some of our, our beets and barley and corn that are grown in the basin there. A uh, few things we've, I've picked up from doing some reading and talking to other folks in terms of production notes. Like I said, you can grow it on marginal ground with low inputs, but you're going to have, you're going to lose some yield. And this, again, this is talking about the, the field crops, not the CBD um, crops necessarily. Uh, manage like a high yield corn crop. It is a host of northern root rot nematode, which is an issue for sugar beets for us in the basin. And it's susceptible to pythium and fusarium, again, which are, which are also issues for some of the crops we grow. So just things to think about and that it does, we, we'll need to think carefully about how it fits into the rotation. We don't have a lot of, it does not have a lot of pest pressure currently for us. That may change if we grow a lot of it, but right now it's, it doesn't have a lot of pest pressure. It can be highly competitive against weeds if you grow it in a fiber crop or in the field just because it grows so thick and, and dense, it can be highly competitive against weeds. But we don't have any labeled pesticides for it either. Um, and CSU has some, has some good resources on some insect management considerations in hemp if you're interested in looking up that information there. So regulatory notes, this is just Wyoming specific, but I'm gonna go through this pretty quick and then I'm gonna let these, um, there's a couple guys sitting in the back who are just excited to speak up on the topic too. So the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 put marijuana and all of its derivatives and lumped hemp into there as a Schedule I controlled substance. That limited interstate transport, maybe you, mean you couldn't grow it, grow it, it really shut everything down for us. In 2014, the Farm Bill establishes an industrial hemp pilot program. And that, that slide of those 10 states I just showed you, they are all working under the 2014 Farm Bill Industrial Hemp Pilot Program. Um, the hemp and derivatives are still restricted from interstate transport, uh, but you can grow it under, under guidance from the university or the state research programs. In 2015, Wyoming allows the supervised use of hemp ex extracts for the treatment of epilepsy, so basically with the supervision of a doctor. And in 2017, Wyoming designate, designates hemp as an agricultural crop in the state under the 2014 Farm Bill for research purposes, but they didn't appropriate any money, so there was no money to manage the program, so in essence, we still couldn't really grow it here for the pilot program. Then the 2018 Farm Bill removes hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. You probably all are well aware of that. And defines hemp as all parts of the plant that contain less than 0.3% THC. Which means states and tribes can now submit plans to the USDA for a hemp um, regulatory program in the states, should they so choose to do that. Mostly testing and inspection to make sure that, we are, that the crops are staying below 0.3% THC. That becomes sort of the most important piece there. Um, the Wyoming House Bill 171 uh, directs the, the Department of Agriculture to establish a hemp regulation program and appropriate some money for equipment and personnel. That was early February. And then um, on the 25th, House Bill 171 passes the Senate and now goes on to the governor. So my understanding is the Department of Agriculture is in the early stages of developing a regulatory plan and we have a very last, a very current update from Department of Agriculture on the topic. <laughs> I'm Scott McDonald with the Wyoming Department of Ag. Um, <coughs> we have a team of people in the department that have been working very hard on getting these rules and regulations um, drafted, getting a plan drafted that we can submit to USDA. Uh, we, we have draft rules put together. We're in the process of evaluating uh, House Bill 171 and its, its final passage um, to make sure that our plan meets all of the requirements of House Bill 171 and also the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, 171 gives us 30 days in order to submit that plan to USDA. Uh, we have received <coughs> very, very little guidance from USDA as far as what that plan needs to look like. Um, they have not drafted any rules or, or, or submitted any rules as far as what their program is going to look like. And according to the Farm Bill, we have the meter exceed their rules. So it's been 
a little bit of a difficult, difficult challenge for the department to be able to draft a plan based on that you know, guidance. And so we're kind of going off um, what some of these other states have done as far as their pilot programs um, and, and melding that into something that fits both 171 and, uh, and the former 2018 Farm Bill. So we're, we're quite a ways into that process. Um, we will submit the plan within the 30 days. Um, we did receive a little bit of guidance from the USDA today um, that states, and we're not sure what this means, we're not sure what the guidance is, but states that if any state submits a plan, they are going to hold it until they have rules and regulations in place. Um, we realized that the 2018 Farm Bill gave them 60 days to review and approve a plan. But it didn't really say what happens if they don't, you know, if they, if they don't comply with that 60 days. Um, so we're not really sure where this is going to go. We intend to submit our plan within the 30 day time period. Um, they have said that they will not have any rules and regulations drafted or submitted or, or out until this fall um, for the 2020 growing season. Uh, we were kind of hoping to get that out a little bit, our, our program in place a little earlier than that to hopefully get some, some stuff on the ground this year. Um, so it, there's still a little bit of gray area when it comes to this. Um, we're going to submit the plan, we're going to have it put together, we're going to go ahead and get the equipment that we need in order to test um, as soon as the governor signs the bill, of course. And um, we'll move forward, but we're not really sure. We can't issue any licenses until we have an approved plan from the U.S. And your best guess is that maybe the 2020 growing season, realistically, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. We don't know where it's going to go. Okay. Um, we're going to submit the plan. We're, gonna, we're, we're in very little control of the timeline beyond that. Um, we'll have everything put in place. We'll have everything ready as soon as we do get that approval. Um, but we're not sure what, what it's, how it's going to work. So. Excellent. Thank you. That's great to have that very current update. Any questions on this topic? Uh, just in general, how does this apply, or how does this relate to certified organic? Is there a demand for I have, certified God, organic I have no idea. <laughs> That's a good question. Do we know? That is a good question. Yeah. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let I'm me. I'll talk about certified organic farms that are diving headfirst into okay. CBD production to get that organic label on there. So a couple closing points here. The film farm bill, this is really critical, less than 0.3% THC. That's gonna, that's really, I, I would say, probably the, the core of the regulatory program that the state's going to have to manage, right? Um, it's going to vary based on cultivar and from my understanding growing conditions particularly stress to the plant and it can fluctuate throughout the growing season and so the growers are, growers are going to need to be able to monitor the THC levels in their crop to catch it before it gets too high because if it gets too high the crop has to be destroyed and so there will be um, a need to, to be aware of that as, you're, as, as, as in terms of just maintaining a, a crop that stays below that limit. And that's why we have that very expensive equipment as right. part of the bill. We could not do this. It's imperative that we are able to test for this. And yeah. So that's why we can't go forward until that's in place. So uh, my understanding was that if you have a hemp crop, it's a hemp crop. It's not going to have more than 0.3% THC. You're looking for people who are illegally growing marijuana and hemp? Or no, hemp it's hemp that above? hemp can go above that. So there's cultivar differences and plant stress and various growing conditions that can cause those THC levels to fluctuate. So maybe 0.3 to 0.4 to 0.5, I'm guessing. I, I, mean, I don't know. You're not going to, my understanding is you're not going to be able to get enough THC in that hemp crop to be useful for, for, uh, for marijuana, but you still... There, that is the standard, the federal standard is that 0.3%. So if a producer creeps up to 0.4%, then their crop suddenly becomes illegal, right? It needs to be destroyed. Once it goes up, can it come back down? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Brian says no. I'm going to defer to him on that one. So your host. So don't let it get high. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What would be the legal repercussions for a grower whose plant gets stressed, produces over 0.3%? No idea. Crop so, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell them. <laughs> The farm bill um, essentially it requires a corrective action plan. Um, so if once we received the regulatory test that was above 0.3% THC, we would negotiate a corrective action plan with the grower. Um, that would involve uh, what to do with that crop, um, whether you know how how it's either disposed of or the THC is rendered in, inaccessible um, in that crop. It would involve additional testing in, in okay. certain years as we move forward. Um, 
the way it's written, if a, I think it was free, um, once we get free positive above 0.3% test from that grower, that grower is then not able to have a license for okay. five years. Um, and that's actually a sign, though. So you wouldn't be able to receive a growing license for five years um, once we get three positive tests from that growth. So um, that would also be involved in the corrective action plan. Um, it, there, there wouldn't necessarily be any legal action beyond that, um, unless it was you know, a marijuana growing in <laughs> that situation, which um, is not good for either crop. But, um, so anyway, corrective action plan, and then move forward. Thank you. I have a question about banking in Is there a protocol set to where you're testing day one of the plan, or? C CDA has a testing protocol, and I can talk about that maybe towards the end. We're gonna try to leave like 20 plus minutes for questions because we knew that would be the biggest part of this. Um, <laughs> she was gonna speak for 20 or so, same here, and then we'll, and I'll, we'll answer as many questions as best as we can. But I think we're all learning in the room. That's why it's so smart. Um, let me do this real quick. So I'm Brian Mitchell. I'm a PhD student at um, Colorado State University, and I've gotten really inter interested in hemp over the last year and had the opportunity to not only visit a lot of organic farms over the summer that are diving into this, mainly with CBD production, um, but I also had the opportunity to work on a density irrigation study at CSU. So we're growing hemp on university land and looking at all kinds of different factors. So um, quickly, so this um, past summer, I went to Boulder County and we were touring a bunch of farms with students. And we were mainly working with a vegetable grower, and he didn't really like these CBD growers because they do stuff a little bit differently. And, and, but what we're seeing is large organic farms that have USDA certification that are using this organic land to plant CBD. And a lot of times they're bringing in these CBD growers and they say, hey, I've got this, these genetics, you have this land, let's work together. And so this farm was large, I don't know their acreage, but they were doing dozens and do dozens of acres of CBD hemp production. So right here, you can see that independent grower that's working on this farm, planting some um, CBD clones there in the field and just clean cultivating there. And so as we continue to walk around this farm in Boulder County, I don't wanna name any names, but this was a crop that had been planted much earlier. So our visit was right after this uh, spring semester, so it would have been late May. And this crop had already been up and planted for, um, goodness, at least six weeks or so. And so here's that difference between your fiber and seed industrial hemp and your CBD industrial hemp is you've got this uh, Christmas tree shape. A lot of times they're prunes to maximize the flower production. Um, goodness, probably five or six foot centers in row because that plant grows so big. And these were, I know I'm not very tall, but these were at least as tall as me and it wasn't even close to, um, the summer solstice when the plants start flowering. So they're gonna to continue to grow until um, the start of summer. And so a lot of growers are doing this. And so um, I'm seeing not just this farm, but others, they're incorporating CBD hemp into their crop rotations around their organic vegetables. And also in Fort Collins, there's a, a lot of interest in this. And I've talked to some growers and people that are working on genetics. And um, these type of operations are working with farmers because there's a lot of money right now. We're kind of riding this bubble of CBD production. It's very, um, very lucrative for a lot of farmers where you know profit margins are small and they see this opportunity of, um, like the numbers Caitlin was showing where just huge return on that and, and then exponentially larger than your fiber and seed markets as well. <clears throat> and so I had the pleasure, um, goodness, um, about a year ago to start working with one of our research scientists and he's now retired as of last week or so. Um, but he's really been a big driver at CSU um, down in the Four Corners area um, with hemp production, getting hemp research going at Colorado State. We're falling way behind Purdue, Cornell, University of Wisconsin, University of Kentucky, um, some of these traditional areas where hemp's been a big crop. And so he wanted to see how this would grow in our environment. And so what's one of the biggest things about Colorado and here? Well, we have limited water resources. And so he wanted to look at what are the effects of deficit irrigation on hemp. And we did this at the Hort Farm at CSU the same farm that Natalie was just talking about, right across the road. This was a conventional product uh, project. I tried to do it organically as much as possible, but we did have um, non-organic input. And so it was a two-year project. I helped with the second year, and we did it on around an acre or so. And so we looked at three different cultivars of fiber seed hemp. And the first one has this, this um, 
special aspect to it. It's on CDA's last list of certified seed. And so um, I know back in 2016, there were seven approved seeds, mainly from Italy, Poland, and um, goodness, Serbia, like this one. And so a lot of our seeds imported, it's much easier. Um, now we have certified seed and Colorado was the first to do that in the United States, but um, I'm getting off topic here. So in Helena, we grew that both years. And then once the scientists figured out everything that we needed to do and tweaks, tweak things, we added a few new cultivars. We have um, Fedora 17 and Felina 32. And so these are French hemp seed crop types. And so you're mainly looking at seed productions. And in some early trials, these showed a lot of drought tolerance and um, a geneticist at CSU that's also really interested in, in hemp recommended these. And so, and again, this is a Serbian origin and this is what they call a dual purpose crop. So you're growing for the fiber and the seed. So Helena's got a lot of cool things about it. And so this experiment looked at if you happen to run out of water, you have limited water resources, um, how is that going to affect your hemp crop? As you mentioned, less water, less inputs, you're going to get lower yields, and it might not make economic sense to grow this. And so everyone's getting really excited about this, but we don't have a whole lot of facts and U.S.-based research. And so I mainly want you guys to focus on those um, bullet numbers on the right. And so our first treatment, as soon as we planted in mid-May, we made sure we had a good stand and then we just cut off the irrigation. So our first treatment just got less than an inch of water. That includes precipitation, which um, wasn't a whole lot last year. We had another treatment that once we had first flower, so right around that summer solstice, June 21st, we um, shut off the irrigation to that treatment as well. So each of those treatments had three, the three cultivars in it, all randomized, we had 60 plots, and that got four inches um, throughout the year. This was about towards the end of the season, about two weeks before harvest. And then once we hit that flowering date, we looked at um, these three treatments and how we figured out how to dial in and really water this without using more or less than we actually needed is by using this Y system. And this is a CSU developed um, online tool that tells you based on precipitation, crop, and your location, how much do you need to water this week? And how often do you need to water? And so we basically, like you said, high input crops like um, high yielding corn, we looked at um, that as our proxy. So we plugged in corn as our crop coefficient. And then we also looked at a third less and a third more than corn to see what would happen. And so you can see about 14 inches or so for, for the corn and then about four inches more or less depending on the other treatments. And so we, what we looked at at the end of the day, and I'm sure you guys will, the most common question will be like, so what'd you figure out when well, my boss is working on crunching all the numbers and doing the statistics? I can provide you some um, anecdotal stuff, but we looked at soil moisture I use a new neutron probe to really dial in and measure that exactly. And then of course we're concerned about yield and how that relates to irrigation. And so we looked at not only vegetative biomass, you know, collecting those hemp stalks and separating everything from the stalks and weighing those, but we also looked at stand count. How did our planting rate, um, you know, when those, that good stand came up, we had all these little seedlings like this that are so vigorously coming up, they're flipping soil clods over. Um, we have a little crossing issue at Arctic South and um, very vigorous. But um, at the end of the season, you're going to have less stocks, less plants, and that can affect yield too. So we looked at that stem diameter. And then, of course, for CDA compliance and because things like water stress, as you mentioned, um, can affect those cannabinoid levels. And so, of course, we don't want to have THC, um, but maybe CBD would pop up in, you know, um, 3% or something like that. So we wanted to make sure to not only meet the – we work with the CDA quite a bit and, and their program around hemp with um, – Dwayne Sinning and uh, goodness, Terry Moran. But we also want to look at treatment differences. Did the lack of irrigation um, cause our industrial hemp to get hot, which is what a lot of people call it. And then finally, I went through every week and took detailed observations. My boss was most interested in flowering characteristics and how that's affected by the irrigation. But I took notes on everything from insects to irrigation that I found in late leaves and all kinds of other really neat stuff. So, you can see our layout here. Most industrial hemp farmers wouldn't use drip, but it was the easiest way for us to get good measurements on how much water we're putting out and just getting um, as much water as we needed, not more, and then right where we needed it too. So set up this acre with drip, and um, yeah, those are our seedlings coming up. So now I'm just gonna watch you get, walk, walk you guys through this um, just kind of picture view of what it's like to be in the field for a whole year. So my experience of being the man on the ground growing this stuff. And so this is just eight days after planting with a plot planter. We had great germination. Like I said, they came up so vigorously and so uniformly, they were just flipping soil clods over. And so you can see the kind of stereotypical leaf right here with the serrated edges and um, still have the cotyledons and everything. Within a couple of weeks, you already get plants that are about a foot tall or so, and you get some branching 
you start to see the more stereotypical um, compound leaf, um, uh, compound leaf, the palmate leaf, compound leaf, and um, really quick cover too. We had our we had spaces between the rows so I could navigate. We could plant a cover crop in between to keep the weeds down. But I've read that within three or four weeks after planting, you get 90% soil cover. So if you've got issues with um, warm soils, weeds, this could be um, you know have some potential. So this is a month and a day after planting, and you can see those stereotypical compound leaves with um, five, seven, nine, eleven um, lobes at times. Um, it's not like that CBD hemp that I just showed you. So again, Christmas tree, sh Christmas tree shape. Uh, they prune that. This just comes up. It does have some like branching above the, the leaf nodes, but for the most part, it grows more like corn. Just a single stalk with a flower at the top. And, um, <coughs> yeah, just a really super neat plant. So two months after planting. Um, we had some male, actually we had male flowering way earlier than that, but I took this picture. Males flower, they actually come out in the field three to four weeks earlier than female flowers, and they're completely different. So you mentioned that it's a dioecious plant, just meaning that we have male and females in different plants, and this is what a male plant would look like. And so they flower earlier, they're a really heavy pollen producer, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but they are trying to breed the industrial hemp for fiber and seed cultivars to be more monoecious because male plants like they're just garbage. You actually have to pay laborers to go out there and rug those plants. I mean, they're good for the pollen, you want good seed set, um, but they don't provide good fiber and they're not providing any seed, of course, because they're males. And so what they're trying to do is, especially in Europe, is breed those monoecious crops where, um, I'll show you when we have the female flowers, um, where those male flowers would be. And so this is almost three months after planting. You can see the crops yellowing out. We were still irrigating. We probably had a, um, you know some leaching with, um, a few leaks we had and stuff. You can also see we did a sorghum sedan grass cover crop in that bottom right corner. And so I think they were stressed when I cut that down at the appropriate time. Um, but you can start to see the female flowers develop. Also the height too. I mean, we hit nine or 10 feet and I know it grows a lot bigger on the coasts, but we're just given the water it needs. We don't have 30 plus inches of irrigation each year. So I'm um, also very, very fragrant by this point. Um, and I realized if I just turned around and took a picture of this treatment, it was a much better picture, much better lighting. And so now you can see these colas informally called buds, flowers, but the cola is this arrangement of these little tiny female flowers. And so by now, again, these are nine feet tall and um, getting a lot of nice female flowers being produced. And so I would walk through and take different observations, everything from when the first bee arrived to plant pests, the ecology, um, was taking note of flower times, which could be different based on treatment and cultivar, um, and just every, everything else that I noticed as well. It's pretty cool. And so now a full four months after plants, you can see the leaves are yellow even more, and that's actually a good sign that your plant's putting all that energy into um, flowering and seed production. Um, we're about a month away from harvest or so, and like that picture that Caitlin showed, um, these colas, they basically um, get pollinated and ripen from the bottom up. And this is actually in a really cool spiral, some of the colas are, which is really neat. But you can see as these, um, the hiss dry up, um, that opens up, and there's your, your hemp seeds that you're trying to produce right here. And so one interesting thing, not only is hemp, um, not only can it be monoecious or dioecious, it's also a hermaphrodite. So under stress, it can actually change sex. And so I noticed um, about a week or so before we harvested, actually a few days, that we had a lot of males start to flower again, a lot more pollen than I'd seen in the last few weeks. But then I saw this plant in the top right. And if you notice, like what I should be seeing on a male plant are, you know, simple, white, um, small, insignificant, five petaled flowers. But I noticed some weird activity over here, and the closer I got, I'm like, well, that's a morphologically, a, like a visibly male plant with seed production. And so I found that towards the end of the season, once we cut off irrigation going up into harvest, that these plants can actually change sex. Now, if this male produces seed, hey, actually, maybe males will be worth something because I've got a little bit of seed right there. But the problem is actually the flip side. So after thinking about this for a day and went back to the the field, I'm like, well, wait, are my female flowers changing to male? And yes, they were, especially in the non-irrigated treatment. So treatment one and two that we shut off months before this, a lot of their female colas that have been very small, you know, not great for yield, um, a lot of those had just changed to male, dried up, died, and then I got no seeds out of those treatments. And so really important consideration, I'm sure. Um, I asked a few, um, I've been asking around, and apparently indoor growers that are cultivating different kinds of cannabis, this is a huge reason not to stress your plants out. And that's just anecdotal, but you can get hermaphroditic changes with all kinds of cannabis plants. And so this was a couple weeks after harvest, but I continued to visit the field. Here's a little bit better of a shot of that um, 
uh, marbled hemp seed. It's actually an egg keen, so like the little dots on or the dots outside of a strawberry. So it's actually like a nut. But again, those ripen all the way up. I think we harvested uh, two weeks before this, but I continue to visit the field and you can tell we turn off the irrigation because everything's drying up. And so that was the end of the season. A few of them, you know, especially for the growers in the room, we did have challenges. Again, there's no pesticides labeled for this. Um, we had a couple of hailstorms, and those are really localized in Fort Collins, but they can be really intense. And we planted this crop. It was about a foot or two tall. I was getting really excited. It's covering the ground. And then we had a devastating, like, quarter-sized hailstorm right over our farm. And so if you look at this picture right here, it's a little blurry, but these plants are just snapped in half. Basically, anything over a foot tall, the wind blew it over, just got beheaded by the hail. But luckily, this is a really resilient crop. And they threw up two, two stems where they had one and actually put on two colas. Um, so I'd be really curious to see if pruning was a thing in just your um, With the bees, I, I've alluded to that a little bit, and I know we have some uh, people interested in bees in the room. Um, the hemp plant is one of the heaviest pollen producers in the world. And so walking through this field, I noted the first time I saw a bee, but by the end of the season when the males were flowering, um, that field just moves and hums. So as long as you're not messing with them and they're eating and they're happy, Everything's cool. I'm allergic, so nothing happened to this. Um, also, I wanted to point out here too, because I'm noticing there's a Monisha's cultivar that this bee is flying up to. You can even see the pollen sack. But so here's that that coal at the very tip, and it kind of spirals spirals around. And then here's how the Monisha's crop crops end up looking. So there's your little tiny white petal male flowers, um, rather than having a separate plant. But yeah, bees love this, and so um, you know I've been thinking a lot about agroecological uses for this, and so. If you have, let's say, a vegetable farm, but you're worried about, say, you know, um, pollinator health, it might be nice to have a hemp plot on the side because, again, this flower is mainly in the summer, and it would be a good food source. Now, there is no such thing as hemp honey, and I want to speak up for the CSU um, entomologist, the insect guy that's been doing a lot of work around hemp. Unless it's value added and somebody's putting CBD into it, there is no nectar from the hemp flower, but it is a great food source for your, your pollinator. And then finally, I know this is an even rougher picture than the top one, but you guys can see this little yellow splotch. Birds are probably your biggest pest. I'm not going to go out and net an entire field, and I don't want to act as a scarecrow either. I mean, I tried to scare them away as much as I could, and they come right back. Um, but that's an American goldfinch, and they just rest right on those stems, blown in the wind, and eat the seeds right out of the colas. I also had doves that basically, once those seeds open up, dehiss, hiss, and then shatter onto the ground, the doves feed throughout. But luckily, we have a bunch of hawks too, so... Some of those doves got what was coming to them. Um, but overall, I mean, that was kind of the race towards the end. You know, we were collecting all this data, doing the neutron probe and everything else. And it's like, we need to harvest. We need to harvest. You need to get the town, the scientists, and harvest because these birds were just affecting our yield numbers probably. So huge pest and definitely a consideration if you're going to dive into this. And so to wrap up the, the season, so that's the field in, in Fort Collins. We always get a a killing frost the first or second week of October. I harvested samples from all of our 60 plots and then actually stomped on these bags in a really goofy dance that I can't believe I started to actually do in front of you guys. But we took all these samples and then I stomped on these bags and what that effectively did was separate the leaf matter and the seeds from the stalk so we could take our measurements. I'm sure there's way better ways to do that. But that said, I took all of our measurements and, and um, weighed all the, the vegetative biomass. And then actually through, after some hunting, found at our bigger research facility, Ardec, that they had a nice seed clearance that they often use for corn. And I used that to clean up the hemp seed from something that looked like this with all the debris that I stomped out of those bags into the seed cleaner, which I made a huge mess and a huge stick for a couple days. And then that's all the waste to clean up the seed to get to that point. So again, we just did representative samples to see what this would do, but um, I'm sure there's industrial processes that are way, way better. And so just some final hemp thoughts. I think um, over the next few years in Colorado that the industrial hemp acreage will uh, increase exponentially, especially for the CBD production, because we also saw those numbers on um, how much more you can get out of your field from that. Um, one of the biggest, um, after talking to a lot of growers, one of the biggest problems we have with the fiber seed or the dual purpose cultivars is processing infrastructure. You have to have a chemical way to wreck this stuff. Otherwise, you're leaving it out in the field and it's getting... Um, exposed environmental conditions. Also, we haven't done this a lot in the United States for a very long time, so field reading may be a thing, but there's chemical industrial processes for separating out the bast and the herd, so those two kinds of fibers and everything else. So I've already talked to um, quite a few people from Portland to Colorado, that um, that's the big thing for Colorado and a lot of surrounding states is just getting that infrastructure where if farmers are gonna dive into this for multiple reasons, like we, we're 
maybe can move across state lines soon with the new farm bill, but it sounds like everyone's still trying to figure that out and the government shutdown didn't help either. And so right now we gotta look at what resource do we have within state until the, everyone figures out all the laws. And then finally, as I explore this as um, a research topic for the, new, the next few years, I think research will continue to, programs will grow across the country and develop a lot more science-based information. Um, I mentioned there's a few schools that are really diving into this, but a lot of the research that I read is out of Europe and, and Asia and stuff because they never dropped this as a crop. And so they've been continuing to grow it and breed it and yeah, we're way behind. But that's it. So if you guys have any questions or comments, we would love to, to take those. Yes, sir. Uh, any diseases that you noted in your experiments, like you mentioned the susceptibility to picking and, and, um, and fusarium and yeah. or downing mildew or any of these things? So um, I actually didn't notice anything. If anything, I, I was watching the field so carefully that um, when that, that stand first came up, I didn't notice that we had a few seedlings that just died off. And I would check them every morning and stuff. I'm like, where are these seedlings dying? So maybe a little bit of damping off in the field, which can't be an issue with some seeds. But um, for me and some of the other research in some of the wetter regions where white mold and the diseases that she brought up, um, I didn't see any issues. No, no pest issues either. I mean, we had bees and we had a few things chewing on them, grasshoppers, but nothing that is devastating. <coughs> I suspect that it's a semi-arid semi environment here that it helps with that. It did help, and again, we're putting that water where we need it. It's not overhead water, it's not part of the pivot system, stuff like that, and um, yeah, I was trying to really march with it. And, and, but yeah, I mean, issues can pop up, and I think what we'll see with that increase in acreage is we'll see an increase in pests and probably disease issues as well. I was just reading something out of Purdue that was saying that um, if you're considering putting this in the crop rotations, you really should avoid planting hemp after numerous crops. I can get you more information. I actually have a handout as well from, from that institution where white mold is an issue, and if you plant it after certain crops, it's still in the field, and then the hemp can pick that up. But, um, we had, you can grow hemp for the four years, I think, before you can rotate it out, but it actually is fine in that system. And we had planted hemp the year before, and so we didn't have rotation issues there. Are there maybe perennial characteristics too? It's an annual thing. It's an annual thing. Um, two questions that aren't about your research, because I know you haven't done this yet, but what have you read about it? This getting hot thing, it seems like a huge issue that we need to be researching is what makes plants get hot? So what, how do we have, is there research existing that says these are the conditions that could push your plants over 0.3? <coughs> My, you My understanding is stress. Well. So it's it's just just you, and that's a very general, uh, well, yeah. I don't know, but it's related to plant stress and cultivar. Yeah. I'm sure there's probably some good information coming out of Canada and their production. I don't know what their legal, you don't know if Canada, they have any sort of THC levels or any sort of- Everything's legal now, so I don't think it matters. It's kind of like in Colorado. I mean, we don't want the hemp to go over, but we don't, and main, the main reason is we don't want marijuana. People are trying to grow marijuana. Uh, that was my understanding. So did you get any hot plants from the stress that you gave them? The you results are still out, so I can oh. speak of those. But ah, we did use yeah. a lab to send off um, like two or three grams from each cultivar, from each treatment, six right. little test tubes to send off to a lab because even though this is bred to have next to no THC, you always get that when they're being plant express. And there's like over a hundred of them who barely know about the first dozen or so. Um, so any, really anytime you have THC or CBD, there's always a ratio of them. So if you have a THC crop, there's a little bit of CBD, CBD, a little bit of THC, and even this, um, you're still gonna get that one. So okay. even visually on the, the plants you stressed or didn't get very much water, could you tell a major difference? And I just want to make Eastern Colorado, they didn't get a lot of rain this last year and nearly every hemp farm had to burn their field. Because they went over. Because they got hot and right. went over. So I can say that they believe that the right correlation is water. definitely. Yeah, so that's why I think so, you're gonna have that's, that's why the science I was working with you wanted to test based on treatment. Yeah. And then also, of course, you know, we work very close with, with the CDA and they know, they know we're trying to come up with resources to help people. So if our field got hot, I mean, we're gonna run it anyway because it's a research farm and you get volunteers everywhere, so. Well, yeah, the other thing uh, I'm say, yeah. I had like volunteers in my high tunnels that were acres away from there. <laughs> <laughs> that was before I started the project. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, so <laughs> Plants to cold stress, do the same thing. I'd be really curious. Yeah, 
or nutrients or nutrients. So you're asking about treatment differences? I know you don't have the data visually. So yeah, just visually, it's amazing. So that, that, that treatment one that we shut off as soon as we saw a good stand, so just a few weeks after planting, those plants were probably about this tall. Their colas were about this long, and a lot of those um, changed over to male and then had basically had no seed yield. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, if you didn't only have enough water to give it an inch, I mean, just don't go ahead. That second um, treatment, maybe a little bit taller, but still really, really poor yield. And then after that flowering and we just differentiated treatments, all those looked pretty similar. I mean, that, that, um, the rate for corn, and then we had one that was a third less or third more. That, that one where we gave them a third more, I mean, yes, the plants were bigger, but I don't think seed yield is going to be that much more. And then even that treatment where it was um, 10 inches instead of 14 inches, that ideal rate for corn, it was still pretty good production. Very tall plants, really long, nice, dark colas, lots of seeds. Um, so again, it's just anecdotal, but much closer between those continually irrigated treatments where we watered them once a week and gave them gallons of water. Uh, but the other, the other two, I mean, they were worth nothing. I mean, even for fiber, you wouldn't make any money, especially at those grades. We showed Tyler. What was your watering schedule? So we use that WISE system. And so, you know, again, it's um, about once a week. And then the water schedule in general, um, goodness, it was kind of complicated with all the treatments. But I'm, not, I'm not thinking treatments. I was just wondering if you were putting water out you know, like vegetables every other day or once a week? So it was mainly once a week, mainly once a week. With those treatments, I got to shut off a bunch of valves. Right. Roughly, it was once a week from about late May until late August. We irrigated once a week. So if you break that out, it's like an inch a little bit more a week. In drip tape. In, with drip tape. And again, that's not the way people would grow it, the, the fiber seed or the dual purpose types, um, but that's the best way Yes. This is mainly for Dr. Sure. Douglas, but do you think that, like, just because right now it seems like this is super risky, like, as a farmer, because, like, of course you have the chance of burning your fields. Wyoming has a lot of things. I'm not sure. Is CBD legal in Wyoming? I don't know. I've heard both ways. So I, I'm going to let this guy admit. My sure, understanding is great. that the Farm Bill changed that as long as everything's below 0.3% THC, it's that took it off the list of controlled substances. Is that that's, your understanding? That's somewhat correct. Somewhat yes. correct. Um, <laughs> it, it did at a national level. It does have to be adopted in the state. Okay, okay. The bill 171 is going to be adopted. Okay. adopted as long as it's derived from the plant, as long as the okay. CBD is derived from the plant, which is. Okay. So, I, and I know there's been some issues with some hot loads being stopped in interstate transport recently. I've heard that. I'm sure there's going to be some confusion for a long time. Yeah. I would think as a producer, you want to be very careful. I would be very curious to see where it goes in the state. The two things I've heard the most is um, CBD production that's coming in from people who are already growing in neighboring states and are going to expand operations to Wyoming. And the second thing I've been hearing a lot is certified seed production because we already produce a lot of really high quality seed in Wyoming. We have a very good seed um, certification program. And we have a lot of producers that could produce um, high quality seed for the oil seed or the fiber. That's, those are the two things I hear people talk about the most. Are the, um, the, TH, the THC testing, I don't know, like, will that cause financial strain, do you think, like, on doing these new crops, like having to get everything tested? Well, I don't my know. understanding is that it would probably be a fee for service, I would imagine, for you guys. And right. that would be the, for the regulatory testing, so that would be their program. Now, Producers already, um, many producers are soil testing and tissue testing for nutrients, and it's not prohibitively expensive. And so I imagine that there will be some of that as well as a producer. It's, it's going to be in your best interest to, to, to monitor your own THC levels as well as nutrient levels of your crop yeah. before then it goes gets too far away and then the BPA is monitoring that as well. So I think there'll probably be both going on. I don't imagine it's going to be prohibitively expensive to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. So. Is there a related question to this? It has to do with organic certification. If under the new farm bill and the, and the change, does this mean that the USDA is going to be allowed to use the USDA organic label for well, what are you doing? The, the low THC versions of cannabis? So people are already doing that. And that, that first farm that I showed, I mean, they're USDA's. Certified organic farm in Boulder County, and because that land is treated organically, and they have a kind um, inspector, certifier, agent that they work with, I mean, their products that are coming out of the farm, that CBD flour that they sell and turn into tinctures or whatever, 
it's cert USDA certified organic. And I was just out in Portland and they're they have a strong organic program. In fact, Washington State's about to get a certified organic label for marijuana. And so I think if they're doing that up in Washington State, then um, you know, we'll be able to do this with hemp as well. In fact, people are already doing it using that label. It depends on your certifier who certifies you and what state you're in right now, but um, I think that's gonna be a big thing for sure. Back to the THC, THC testing too. So in Colorado, the CDA has a protocol where you might be growing for fiber and you might be growing for seed, and then CBD is kind of a different category, but they make you test um, during like the middle of flowering. So I showed you that plant where it's like right around first flower, they flower till September. Somewhere in that window, the CDA comes out and does, does testing. And you also, when you fill out that registration and pay that money and GPS locate to grow hemp, I mean, they know what you're doing and they're gonna come out and test your field. So if you're growing for seed, there's a chance because the way this plant works is in the last 30, 40 days, those um, all can, um, cannabinoids skyrocket towards the end. And so what they, they had the testing for seed producers that you also have to test within 30, day, 30 days of harvesting your seed or at harvest of seed because that 30 day window between like when they want to test the flower and when the seeds are being produced, it can skyrocket like crazy. And so you may be able to get under that 0.3% limit, but then be selling your seeds with plants that have you know three to 5%. I've also heard a lot of anecdotal stories about people that get up to 1% and just kind of get a slap on the wrist right now. Um, they don't want to, you know, CDA doesn't want to see people go out there and destroy their entire crop. So they're trying to work with people because they know the genetics are still struggling and we don't know how they perform in the United States with all this imported seed. So it's long road ahead, but interesting. So I've been struggling with the economic metrics, but I want to just clarify your slide was $28 a pound. Yeah, yeah that was the information that came out from the um, the 10 top 10 hemp producer states in 2017. So is a hemp plant one pound, 10 pounds? Do you have any idea? How many pounds per hemp plant? You know, I don't know how that breaks into the fiber because again, when you're selling, yeah, you know, selling the actual fiber, you're just selling that outer layer of fiber. Um, goodness, with between the stem diameter and the height of some of these plants, I mean, one plant's a pound or two just wet weight, but I don't know how that translates into fiber. I would suggest this Hemp Industry Daily report. That uh, yeah. was very good. Thank you for coming for oh, sharing some information. Discuss, discuss, um, it's, it's actually a very good report, and it's very thorough. It's industry report, uh, and looking at sort of what's been grown in these states really since 2014 farm bill i think um and this is per pound of flour not per pound of cbd and presumably dried flour i guess it doesn't look very much so yeah it's a lot so. where did the 0.3 thc come from what arbitrary is i know so like what is in fact the european union where we get the seeds from this there is there's this 0.1 percent and there's this weird dialogue between the states and the national government right now because we have to be really careful how we frame these state laws because right now, at, at least before the farm bill passed, the United States and Colorado definition were exactly the same with 0.3%, all derivatives and type, et cetera. Um, see, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> but what happens is, is so if the United States with this new farm bill decides that the, the threshold is 1% and we have a more strict law, then we're still stuck to our state law. So there's actually a thousand four columns in our recent local election to free up our definition of industrial hemp in the state and be able to change it based on the way the federal government changes it because if they come up with a looser regulation, which makes a lot more sense, then the state's gonna adapt to that. But that's oh, why you're saying arbitrary. Did you say you can make it a use 0.1 or 1? It must be 1. It must be 1. The you said EU? 0.1% for the well, EU. You see, in the European Union, it's small. So, small. so mm -hmm. their restrictions are even tighter. Wow. We're getting seed over here, but as we grow in the United States, we're, we're seeing all kinds of- uh, We're getting European seed? As well, then? That's the only way we've been able to get it. I mean, Colorado was the first to come up with certified seed. There's a company in Port Collins. Run I imagine by some coming first. out of Canada, I would think. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know what their, I have no idea what their cultivars are, what their federal restrictions, if any, are on their hemp. I don't know. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, so, do you think people are going to be eligible for crop insurance? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, that was the other thing is I, I talked to somebody. With crop insurance the other day, and they 
they are saying that they have a significant amount of their R&D money this year dedicated to figuring out crop insurance for hemp. Like that's a big focus of there's a lot of money going into that. It seems really risky, like if there's mm -hmm. a chance you're going to have to get rid of your yeah. entire crop. And I think there's programs now, whole farm revenue, and a few things you could use to put hemp under. Somebody mentioned that, hey, we even do stuff that's not on the commodity list. Yeah. I so that would be under, about yeah. yeah. So they're, but they're doing a lot of R&D on that. That they're said they are anyway. That farm bill, in addition to freeing that up for, for uh, crop insurance, likely in the future, it also legitimizes hemp research um, and hopefully opens up the yeah, like interstate travel. It's also talked about pesticides that do require start research or start research. Yeah, because right now, by default, it's pretty much is organic. I mean, not, I mean, you can put inorganic fertilizer, but there's no pesticides labeled for it anyway, right? So. Um, Again, it might fall. Yeah, to, yeah, anyway, or chemical pesticide free, I guess. The CSU have uh, some of the extension agent that the agency uh, support for farmers that are trying to grow this year, like helping them. With so we have we have nothing right now. And that's You're looking at it, I think, right here. I was going to say, so I'm like, I'm the CSU hemp program right now, kind of. Um, I mean, I was just an hourly employee of the guy in the field for that and, um, industrial hemp project. I was actually doing my master's research with these guys, and right across the road, they were doing hemp. So <laughs> what are you guys doing? And I was able, lucky enough to angle into that project. But basically, that was funded. You know, we couldn't do hemp research. There's no funding for that. So we were lucky to have this one research scientist with his own agricultural experimentation budget to buy the seed, get the okay, talk to the CDA. And he was a real pioneer in getting started at CSU because they've been really hesitant to even discuss this period. I mean, it's one of the reasons our horticulture undergraduate levels are going up because everybody's interested in this crop, but nobody wants to talk about it. And I think we should talk about it because the big first hurdle is just talking about it like another crop. Like a lot of the questions you've been angling at, there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of issues, and we're just not talking about a crop because it's been lumped in with, you know, narcotic for so many different years just because it's from the same genetic tree. Yes. Yeah. I think right now CSU might be very similar from like the marketing end of things because with extension. The, with the, um, that's so the Pueblo campus does have some other slides that we cut out for the sake of answering questions. But yeah, so the Pueblo campus does have the cannabis in, the re, yeah. Institute for Cannabis Research. Mm -hmm. And there's some activity going on down there. But. I think this guy's actually up in Sterling. Okay, um, yes. And he, he's kind of touching on it as extension agents. We're not quite here yet to where we can just go out and help the farmers with that just because the bill is so new, but hopefully extension agents will officially make a sense for the farmers. And the president of Extension um, has reached out to, to the Specialty Crops Program and me saying, hey, what do we have on this? We're like, nothing. So I think that's my first job after this talk is to write a fact sheet and I mean, Caitlin this, has a great Grab a copy of this well. fact sheet. I could not get this one through as a bulletin for that exact reason. I wasn't allowed, we weren't allowed to publish it as an extension bulletin. Plus, there's like, we're still waiting to hear where, where the legal stuff is. But I just did a literature review because I was getting questions. So right. take a copy if you want. I'm happy to send it to you if you want to share it or whatever. Um, that was sort of my attempt to get something out the door to be able to share with people. And I know Dr. Swanson wants to do that too. So that's what we're helping to get is some extension resources out there. But to inform growers, I was lucky enough to do a field day with Natalie and the crew. and. I answered hemp questions for hours. We got like the best attendance that our field day because we put hemp on the calendar. And it's really good specialty crop again. I mean, one of the reasons we talked about this here is um, there's been some high level talk with some people at CSU and um, different agencies in the federal government, and we would like to see hemp not be excluded as a specialty crop, especially because the CBD production is, I mean, uses a lot of the same infrastructure tools and takes the same care and time than a lot of other specialty crops. So I think we'll see that in the, in the future as well. And, um, yeah, I just had a comment. Um, so I'm from Colorado, so we have had some growers say that they have their um, CBD flowers stolen, so security was a measure they were considered, and they weren't sure if they were gonna, if they stole it to process it or if they thought it was in the water. <laughs> who, who knows? So that's just another, another concern <laughs> in addition to all the other things. Security is an issue, and in fact, one of your friends is actually telling me that yeah, a lot of times they'll they'll grow this and then come in the next day. And I've heard of thefts out of greenhouses where people are doing their, their clone production because the CBD seed market's just nowhere. And so most people are getting little propagation houses on farm and doing their cloning. They find genetics they like and they're planting out transplants. And I've heard of multiple stories of greenhouses getting broken into. And I mean, at a research farm, we have cameras. And I'm thinking about as I get into more of this research, just being science saying, hey, this whole picture. So, <laughs> research, leave it alone. Um, but it does look very similar. So, yeah, but. They said they even have a catalog. Have a catalog. Are you 
Maybe the Washington look more like. Right. <laughs> 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 <laughs>